start with um, the actual marksmanship portion. One of the reasons I'm dividing this up, again, the first part was more theory. This will be um, marksmanship fundamentals as they apply to machine guns because once you learn how to shoot one of them, it applies across the board. So what are, by the uh, book, what are our four fundamentals? Okay. Okay, I heard them all. So we got steady position, you got aiming, which is sight alignment, sight picture, and breath control and trigger control. So let's talk about that in the context of machine gunning. First one we'll talk about is steady position. Uh, that's an important fundamental to gunnery. We talked about cone of fire. Your steady position is largely what controls the size of that cone of fire. Anyone remember what the goal or ideal standard for a good cone of fire is from a machine gun? Two mils, right. And this is how you're going to get it. And the first aspect is having a, a good position. Uh, I'm going to sh uh, show you a video here of a good gunner uh, demonstrating some shooting from a bipod. Let me get back to here. Let me get my video going. The um, person doing the, um, the narration is Korean. So this is not in English, but I was more concerned with them showing a good video because they have, um, not only is the shooter good, but they do it all in slow-mo. So we can actually see how he's doing this here. So let me get to full screen. There we go. You all see that? And more importantly, we'll have the slow-mo here in a second. I'll kill the sound here. What, I'm more concerned with watching this portion, okay? All right, so is the muzzle climbing? He's fairly long burst here, right? What's the gun really doing? Not really so much side to side, but back and forth, right? He's holding the trigger down to fire that burst. The gun's obviously having to, to move back and recoil, going straight to the rear. If your position is good, it shouldn't be doing much of anything else, okay? Nothing's climbing or rising or anything else. The gun comes back and goes forward. Was he putting tons of forward pressure on that bipod? No, because there's no need to. He needs to have a firm control of it. The main thing is you're controlling the weapon so that it's going straight to the rear and then going straight back, okay? And, and we'll have that in slow-mo too. And this is still off the bipod, so just kind of note Again, is he putting a lot of forward pressure on the, le on the bipod legs? No, it's pretty much, I like to con uh, describe this as everything should be thought of as 90 degree angles, okay? Gunner's position, 90 degrees to the line of the bore. The elbows, 90 degrees to the line of the bore. The bipod, 90 degrees to the line of the bore, okay? And you can see here again, the gun just kind of rocks back on top of the bipod legs. And that's going to be able to, as long as you have good control back here, that's uh, going to yield good control across the board. And that's what there is in slow motion. Gun's not really coming up all that much. And all you're trying to do is get it so your position is held firmly, straight to the rear, back and forth, and that's it. And there it is in slow motion. Is his face coming up off of the gun? Nope, it just stays in place. His eye stays behind the sight. You should be able to watch your sights through that entire sequence. I've heard this said too, even with the M2 or the Mark 19 on a tripod, and I've had people claim, well, you can't use, you can't shoot something like the TVS5 and keep your eye on it because the recoil, well, is that true? If you're using the, the, the position, whether tripod or bipod correctly, you should be able to keep your eye right up behind the sight even while you're firing a burst. That's only going to let you observe what the hell you're doing, right? So. So, 
you need to have a firm grasp, but your position or quality of position is not going to be determined by how hard you're holding. You want a light but firm one hand firing grasp when you're using a tripod. Let me give you, actually I'll read that right out of the, um, the FM. If you go through the, the .68, the machine gun, the current machine gun manual, that's verbiage I literally cut and paste right out of that manual. Grab, grab pistol grip firmly. Um, Teeny is held with the left hand. Why are we doing that? See how, exactly, so you're there to make corrections. Why, do we, why is it a crew served weapon? What's the assistant gunner doing? Well, he's, what he's really doing is spotting for the gunner, okay? Just like, I, I like to describe it this way. If you think of it in artil an artillery context, you have a forward observer or someone eyes on target, right? You have someone behind that person, could be miles away, that can receive a call, translate, okay, this is the information they're s telling me, describing that target, that target area. They're gonna translate that into a fire command that then goes out to the gun crew to get put on that piece to fire it, okay? Your gunner and assistant gunner with the machine gun is all of that rolled up in one. The target is either something you can directly observe or is fairly close just because how much further, you can't really engage more than under 2,000 meters with a machine gun, right? Or less, usually less. Quite often they'll have eyes on right there at the gun position. So the whole observer, FDC, and all that stuff is happening right there with that crew. Does that make sense? Okay, but it's the same basic uh, idea there. What the gunner is doing is relying on what he or she, usually he, sorry, is seeing through the sights. The assistant gunner is there, kind of like, um, using an example like a spotter for a sniper, right? You have the, 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 the gun team there. What's the spotter doing for that sniper? Well, he's adjust, adjusting his optic, the spotting scope, so that he can read Mirage to, to gauge wind speed and direction. And then when that, when that sniper fires a shot, he'll be able to see Trace watching the bullet as it goes down range to accurately determine where that impacted. The shooter might not, probably won't be able to see that even with a 10 power optics, optical scope. But with a 20 plus power spotting scope, you can actually see the bullet trace as it travels down range. And can immediately, if it's not a first shot hit, make a quick correction and definitely get, in fact, that's how their qualification works. You get 10 points for a first round hit, but you get five if the second shot hits. So they're all, all giving you the opportunity to make it up if you make a, a misestimation of wind or something else. This is kind of the same thing here. Your assistant gunner is helping the gunner to get that second burst on so then we can start making corrections and applying our gunnery skills, okay? So that's why your left hand is on, on the teeny while, while you're manipulating this. Um, light, re, cheek should rest lightly, if at all, against the comb of the stock. Uh, and, and the butt should be lightly touching the shoulder, if at all. So are you really trying to grind into it when you're shooting off a tripod? Not at all. What, did, what was on the back end of that Canadian and British machine gun I showed you a picture of, which is the identical to our 240? What did they have on the back? Uh, the Just a thing for the buffer, right? There was no stock. They purposely set up their SF kit, sustained fire kit, so that you're not shooting it with a stock. In fact, one of the reasons they use that mortar sight to begin with is so that the gun crew can be below the line of the bore. When they set that up and predetermined points, They'll use that mortar sight with their aiming stakes, so when they have pre-computed data, you're not even sighting the gun at that point. It's already been sighted. You put, you go to a known reference point based on your data card or whatever, and you just shoot the gun that way. I've seen photos of British gunners. They're basically down shooting it like this, working the, the tripod from a prone position. The gun's up here, so they're completely behind cover, still effectively engaging downrange because they've already compiled the data before they started shooting. Make sense? So, that, so it's, again, kind of like the artillery piece. Mortar, the, the mortar man I showed you the picture of wasn't sighting in directly. You lay the gun, and then you fire it. That's kind of the same idea here, okay? Think of it as when you're working a tripod, the tripod controls the machine gun, the gunner controls the tripod. Does that make sense? You, point the, you tell the tripod where it needs to point the machine gun for you. And all you're doing is hand on the, the, the pistol grip. All you're doing to hold it firmly 
is any slack in the mechanism, making sure that that's not giving you a, um, it's not misdirecting. How much play will you have in a, a T&E? Is it going to be like locked in, dead tight, or is it going to have a little bit of slop in the mechanism? All you're doing when you hold against the T&E is ensuring that that slop doesn't point the gun in different places. Okay, that's it. Now, are you able to hold that lightly when you're shooting it from a bipod? No, because there's nothing to support the back end of the, of the, the machine gun, right? So that's what your position needs to be there, is holding it firmly, and you're using your elbows as the tripod in T&E, if you the, will. Um, shooters with the M14, for example, would, instead of going with a stock weld where they have actual face on the wood, they would wrap around the small of the stock with their shooting hand, and then they would use their knuckle or their thumb as that reference point to make sure their head was in the same spot. So shooters would call that a spot weld. Same basic idea. That's essentially what you're getting here. Especially if you're shooting a pro mask or something else like that, you have room you can make adjustments. So I, okay, I can still get my head behind uh, the stock or get my head on the stock behind the sight and use it and you, using your hand position as your reference point then. Okay, I mentioned this before and I actually have a numbers behind it. The tripod, is it primarily an aid to accuracy? We mentioned this briefly before. Is this primary, is that the primary reason why you're using it? Okay. Well, I, just as an example, this is a bit of an extreme example, I ran the numbers. Let's take an artillery piece, a 109 series Paladin. The, based on the, the info I could get, it's got a listed range of th effective range of 30 kilometers, and its required accuracy is to strike within a 180 foot radius at that distance. So how accurate is that? We translate it into minutes or mils or something like that. How much accuracy is that yielding? Now, that's a very expensive artillery piece, right? It's considered a very good one. Anyone disagree? <laughs> okay. So it's capable of, of, of getting strikes, at, accurate strikes at extreme range. What does that translate into if we think in terms of minutes and mils? Okay, I already ran the numbers for us. So let's take a look at that. 30 kilometers, that's 32,500 yards. 180 foot radius is 2,160 inches. That turns into a 12.6 minute of angle target, which is a 6.3 minute radius. Now, how big a target are we shooting with our rifles? At 300? About 20 by 40 inch. So that roughly translates to how many minutes wide at 300? Well, if it's about eight, we'll just make the math easy. Let's say 18 inches wide at 300 works into how many minutes wide? Six, Six minutes wide. So how many minutes is, our, is my Paladin expected to get? That's a six minute radius, which means it's engaging, it's expected to engage a 12 and a half plus minute wide target. Okay, that's considerably less accurate than our rifle that we hold and shoot from our shoulder is getting. Okay, again, it's not sheer accuracy that's the concern. What's the real advantage of shooting something like that, besides the fact it's big and makes noise? And it's high explosive. As far as the control mechanism, it's not the pure accuracy. What is that control mechanism yielding for us? Well, it, it, do I have to even be able to see that target in, in order to engage it? The mechanism, the tr carriage, or with a machine gun, the tripod, and, uh, uh, tr excuse me, traverse and elevation mechanism, the real advantage is that it allows me to put repeatable, consistent adjustments on the gun that I know that I can return to some set point. It's not so much that, oh, now my cone of fire is magically better. It's the fact that I can use this mechanism, predetermined firing points, and can reliably bring my machine gun and point it back in that same spot again. Just like the Paladin or any other artillery piece, I can so reliably aim the thing without seeing a target that I can just trust that the FDC is going to give me an accurate fire command. I can run the numbers, sh should. It's mathematically possible <laughs> that they'll be able to give you an accurate enough command that you can be within 180 feet radius at 32,500 yards away. Okay, The mechanism well, I do that. The T&E is kind of the same thing. I can rely on uh, range card data to do that. I'll give you an example. 
one of the matches we used to shoot at uh, AFSAM and Winston P. Wilson, the, the national, they call them combat matches, but it's the military style shooting. One of, there was a machine gun match that we've shot. The gun crew gets behind their, their tripod mounted machine gun and there'll be a series of targets, usually RETS targets, that you get range card data on. When you actually fire the exercise, they put a bed sheet in front of the gunner's position so he can't see downrange. He's got this bed sheet floating in front of his, his gun, so he can't sight in on anything. He's completely blind. His assistant gunner off to the side can still see downrange, so he can still give him correction. Well, how does he know what target? He doesn't know which target's going to come up first, and of course the exercise is timed. So he doesn't even see a target come up. How does he shoot it? Well, his assistant gunner is going to give him, okay, which of the known established target points to engage. How does the gunner know if he's going to be accurate or not? He's, exactly. Reads the data off a range card, puts that back on the T&E, and, &E, and assuming he did everything right, should get hits, right? And if he doesn't, what's the A gunner going to do? Give him adjustment. I translate that into a mill correction. I can put back on the T&E and, &E and then make a known adjustable amount so I can get that next burst where it needs to be. Okay? That's really the advantage of using a T&E. Okay? Think of it in terms of the character or the uh, classes of fire that I went over before. If you're needing to move your line of fire, grazing fire for example, a set amount or move your beaten zone so that you know you're getting full coverage, that's how you're going to be able to do it. We already established our cone of fire should ideally be two mils wide, so a four mil correction, and that's the number I want you to remember because it'll be important here in a bit, a four mil correction should give you very even coverage as you go across that target area. Okay, and that's not just an arbitrary number thrown out, and we'll see how, why that's the case. So, all right. Um, that's a picture of, the, of a 240 with an M145 optic. It's an LCAN. That's actually a Canadian site who was ragging on Canadians before. Actually, yeah. That, this, this optic they use on the C... Make sure I say it right. What is the rifle? Is it the C7 or the... They, they issue an AR-15 based rifle like we do. The difference is instead of using an ACOG, they issue a sight like that. It's just a different reticle pattern. It's a, um, a post style, kind of like what the British SUSAT uses. And then it's got elevation correction on the base here to engage at distance. And that, ever, anyone messed with the 192 yet? The tripod? Okay, that's what's replacing our 122. The difference is the T&E is included with the tripod. It's actually the, the same mechanism. It's one integral unit. Um, the, the rear legs here fold forward. The T&E disconnects from here, folds down. This pulls off the pinnel, and then you store it right here. So your pinnel, your T&E, and the tripod is all one self-contained unit. That adapter is set up so you can use it for the 240 and 249 with no modification. Um, FN built it so that the distance from your pins are the same on both receivers. Of course, with our 122 not being designed around that, we have to have a different T&E, like this guy. And you can tell this one's for the 240 because it's got the brass deflector on it. Um, but they set ours up, so we have to have a different teeny, and that's one of the reasons why we're going with that. And it's considerably lighter, too. It's like 11 pounds total, I think. It's actually small enough it fits in the barrel bag, which is what it was designed to. The A-Gunner carries the barrel bag, which has that, um, I think it's Nomex, whatever, it's heat-resistant panel. You can actually swap your hot barrels onto. That tripod will fit inside there, too, with the spare barrel and all the other accessories. Um, that's the... Well, now it's the LW50, but the 307-312 by General Dynamics that they're slating to replace the M2 by 2012. Um, it has a different uh, T&E setup. These two knobs here are what you're doing all your adjustments with, and that's built into the tripod as well. Okay. Um, what is this illustrating? Okay, so that's your left and right limit, right? What you're establishing, how do you establish that? Unless someone on the range tells you. 
okay? And for example, we'll assume that this position is on the left edge of the, 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 your, your line of troops here, right? This is stopping you from going too far in, because what's over this way? Your folks, right? But I, want, I need to be able to go that far because what would the gun be set up to be shooting right now? See how the, the teeny is way over to the left? So I'm assuming this position must be on the left edge because what would it be, if it's touching the sector stake here, what would this line here down this open area likely be covering? You're intersecting, right. I'm assuming off this photo, because I'm seeing fairly open terrain this way, they purposely set the gun up, so this would be your, either your final protective line or they have some likely avenue of approach such that, assuming these guys know what they're doing, that's gonna establish inflating fires. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Because you have the mo probably not a lot of stuff rushing through this very thick brush here, but if this is completely open down this way and we have a line of our folks this way, does that make sense? So you're starting to under see that, oh, okay, yeah, because you're inflating fires, because if everyone's running down that long open way, I get continuous danger space, so I got good grazing fire. Okay, and they're having, they, they set their position up to take advantage of all that. And of course, then what's this? That'd be your range card. That's got all that pre-plotted data for, okay, if they don't come down this most likely avenue of approach, they might come from over here, so I have everything pre-plotted to make best use of the established position. Okay, um, okay, so that goes over position. Next fundamental we'll talk about is aiming. Basic concept of sight alignment and sight picture. Is it really any different versus shooting a rifle? And this is, I think, part of the confusion with a gunnery thing is you can shoot a machine gun like a big belt-fed rifle. Certainly can. Okay? In some applications, that might be the best way to go. Um, so put your sights dead center what you're trying to hit, fire a burst, and get good target effect. Now, what by doctrine do we normally teach people for the sight picture part of aiming? Center base, center base not center mass. Why? Okay. Wait a minute. <laughs> We did it went over steady position. Is that true necessarily? Well, I, I guess I don't want to teach a fundamental that compensates for lousy position. See, kind of like, well, adjust your sights to compensate for a flinch. Why don't you fix? Anyway, um, okay. So that was. I know that's always been. A, this is one of the reasons I like to do this class, right? Because it's like, oh, that's a repeated, commonly repeated answer. But we've just seen the slow motion video of a, of a known good shooter and I didn't see any real barrel rise during those even fairly lengthy bursts so we can pretty much toss that out so why do we aim center base then because it's what the FM says that's a fair answer okay well let, let's a uh, cu couple reasons here um, first reason what are we pl placing downrange? So two things when we, our cone of fire travels downrange is what is this whole thing called? Trajectory. The trajectory, and if it's unbroken and continuous, it would be the danger, danger space, right? And if it's unbroken and, and continuous, that would be effective with respect to the ground. Starts with a G. Grazing, Grazing fire, right? Okay. If I'm establishing known points on a range card or I am prepping to support an assault element okay that's the objective and I want to start here and I've determined that the best approach for me to engage this objective area to support and suppress it would be well just in this example assume that for we can shoot grazing fire along its length I don't have a target to aim at yet okay whatever it is we're gonna shoot hasn't shown up yet or I'm prepping a range card even though I can see an objective in front of me, but I'm not actually firing at any specific thing. So what would I be aiming center mass of if there's no target to shoot yet? Because I need to be able to lay my sights on something, because otherwise how am I going to know if my range card data is any good?
because unless I fire a shot to, what do you call it, registering a gun in artillery speak, right? Unless I fire a shot to register the gun to know where my shots are going to fall, I have to depend on my sights telling me where the barrel's pointing and giving me good hits. I don't have a target yet, so what do I aim at? Well, how do I know if I'm establishing effective grazing fire down some line without actually shooting first? How am I, how am I going to be confident that I can hold my sights on some point? Okay. Well, first of all, we need to know the distance. How, what, distan what kind of distance can we get grazing fire up, up to, roughly? About 600 meters, right? Okay, so if I was going to shoot straight into a target 600 meters away, what do I do to my sights first? Slip to 600 meter setting, right? There are my 600 meters zero, and I would aim at it, but there's no target there yet. Or I'm establishing grazing fire. The target could be anywhere from a few, theoretically a few meters in front of my muzzle all the way out to 600, and it could be anywhere within that range. Where am I trying to aim? Down that entire 600 meter length. Okay, if I set my zero up so that I hold center base. I could essentially use some aiming reference, just the ground itself actually, at that distance and hold, set the sights there. Okay, I need to establish grazing fire to shoot across this final protective line, as an example. I have some length of ground less than 600 meters in length. If I just pick a spot out at whatever that distance is, it could be up to 600 meters away or roughly five, whatever, and I just hold the aim at the ground at that point away, would I establish effective grazing fire? Because if I'm at 600 meters away, where in the trajectory is my projectile? It should be right back at my line of sight, correct? And if I'm 600 meters and in, I'll be less than a meter off the deck. And any distance in between, right? So if I just aim at some reference point, the ground itself, at that distance, will I have good grazing fire across that length? Yes. Okay. So, aiming center base makes sense then, because I can use the ground itself as an aiming reference, assuming there's no target to appear. Another reason, think in terms of beaten zone. You're not shooting at a two-dimensional object, a target image or a silhouette. What are you really engaging? Three-dimensional. Thinking in terms of danger space is one way to start thinking of three dimensions, because I have the entire line of fire from my muzzle down to some extended distance. And anything that tries to cross that line, I can still shoot, even though I'm not moving my sights to it. Okay? The other thing is, if I'm using, trying to place my beaten zone on top of something, I'm not shooting at a two-dimensional image of this. It's an actual crew serve tarp point, in this case, or some other fighting position, or a vehicle, something that has depth from my position. Okay? And I'm trying to center my beaten zone over the top of it. Now, if I set my sights up so that I aim center mass and get an impact on my sight, and I place, lay my sight dead center of that target, where are the shots going to go that go high? Are they still going to hit the target? They're actually going to go over. Okay? If I have shots in my beaten zone that strike in front of the target, can that still be effective? First of all, if I hit low, is it possible that those bullets could ricochet up in the target? Absolutely, and if you've ever seen a RETS target up close, the plastic silhouette, look at the base of that target just above the ground line and you'll see ragged holes in it because a piece of dirt or something from the ground got chewed up because a bullet hit low. That still probably would have took that target down. And I would argue it should because that's still a hit. And even if that bullet doesn't get a hit or even get a ricochet, could that still be effective? What's our working definition of suppressive fire? Any shot that's within a meter of your intended target or target area, or if there's no target, the, the suspected area, if you're shooting within about a meter of that point and you can keep a shot going in there at least once every several seconds, most people are probably not going to want to venture out. Makes sense, right? Because they are now not being scared by your noise. They visually can see that you really could be killing them. <laughs> and you're proving it because you're hitting that close. You know, it's not just bullet whizzing by through the air randomly, but oh my God, they're really actually shooting at us, right? So you would get better target effect. If you're holding center base at that point, shots that go low are going right in front of it. Shots that are going high are probably still getting hit because you have the entire height of the target. In the long range shooting world, they call it a reverse image zero. 
it's the same idea. You essentially set up a zero so that instead of holding center, center point of some target, you're actually going to try and shoot for the base because I have the entire height of the target that my trajectory can still work within and still get hits. Okay? So that's why we're using a center base hold with a machine gun. Now, interestingly enough, the Aussies, when they, when they issue the, what they call the F-89, our Minimi, they will shoot it like a rifle. In fact, they shoot what they call a gallery course. We call it a KD range. All right? Their doctrine for it, when they issue a, a, an automatic rifle is you shoot a rifle course of fire with your 249. And they teach hold center, center, uh, center mass, aim center mass, and zero for that because you're shooting individual point target silhouettes because you're shooting it like a rifle, an automatic rifle. A rifleman shoots individually aimed shots one at a time in semi, as a semi-auto. An automatic rifleman shoots individual three-round bursts, okay? But you're essentially shooting an individually issued weapon against point targets, right? Now, our doctrine has you still shooting center base, and that's kind of where I think some of the confusion is. It's like, well, is it a machine gun or is it an automatic rifle? And, you know, because I mean, we do the qual, it's like, well, you're on the 10-meter machine gun target, but you're shooting an automatic rifle. Anyway, I think that's part of the confusion as well. But you could set this up to do a variety of things. This is the reason why, with a machine gun at least, center base is probably better. Make sense? Okay. All right, trigger control, the other fundamental, where steady position controls the size of your cone of fire, aiming controls the location. You hold center of base, and you want your cone of fire to be right above that for the reasons we just discussed. Trigger control is what you use to modulate the burst. What's the, uh, by doctrine, uh, automatic rifle usually is supposed to shoot how many rounds in a burst? Three. Three, uh, three to five, rough, about three. How many rounds do you shoot if you're shooting a machine gun? Five to seven by doctrine, right? Um, a good gunner should be able to control that on demand. In fact, um, I've shot a submachine gun course, happened to be with Uzis, but it doesn't matter, um, where one of the drills they would do is kind of like, kind of like a, a pyramid trigger control exercise where you'd leave the, the sub gun set to full auto and then from low ready present and fire one shot with, a, with it set to full auto. So a trigger control, you're modulating to press and release one shot. And then you do for the second presentation two shots. And the third presentation you do it for three shots and on and on and on is how higher you want to go. But the idea is you're controlling the specific number of rounds fired in the burst on demand. Okay. Um, Doctrine may say, yeah, you want to keep the burst short, but you can pick and choose longer or shorter based on your needs. And that ends up being uh, a con trigger control issue. Is that usually a, a cause of like major misses with something this big? I mean, it can. Most of the problem that I've seen as far as trigger control problems uh, with, with more novice uh, machine gunners or automatic rifle men is that they're so concerned about stopping the burst that they'll you know, the thousand degree trigger, right? Because they're finger off. And I've literally seen people fire burst and you can watch <laughs> portions of the, the burst actually go out one direction or the other. Uh, for right-handers, I've seen it a lot where it ends up going up at two o'clock because they're actually muscling the gun up against the, the bipod and it redirects. So you'll see a shot or two go off in that direction. Um, do, you want, do you want to squeeze a fully automatic uh, trigger on a fully automatic weapon? Absolutely not. I think I liken it more to a switch. Press it to fire your burst, release it to stop it. So it's not a ginger press, it's more of a turn it on, turn it off. And as long as you're not influencing the location of your burst, then you're fine. Okay, the 10 meter target. Let's talk about what this is for. Um, right here. What is this representing? Okay, so we got a, okay traverse and search. That's right. Okay, but what are these? Is this supposed to be a, a silhouette? Vehicle window. So this is one of those things. I, I've heard all kinds of theories. I've never seen anything written what this is actually trying to represent. As far as uh, people will call them pasters or tombstones. I mean, I don't think we're actually training to shoot tombstones though. 
okay? Well, let's, let's talk about what the target sizes are and why the, the, uh, this target is set up that way. Obviously, we got the four separate panels, okay? So you got four different arrays of, of targets. And of course, the FM will dictate for the 10-meter course, you'll have this practice phase, and then you'll have this portion and it's scored, whatever, great. But what is this target actually representing? Well, let's try the math out. Anyone know how big those targets actually are? Ever taken a ruler to them and how big is that square? One centimeter. The square is one centimeter, very good. How wide are these paster whatevers? That's a four centimeter width, good, and about five centimeters tall. Okay, it's 10 meters away. What do you think the square represents? Well, it, it represents the square is at about the base of the target, so that's a good reference point. Because if I hold 6 o'clock or I hold the bottom edge of that black square, that would be the base of whatever this is supposed to represent. Make sense? Cool. How big is it? Now, we said it's one centimeter. How does it work out with the angles, with the math? You're 10 meters away. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a hint. 10 meters is 1,000 centimeters. And it's a one centimeter square. So if I'm a thousand centimeters away, that means that square must be what? It's one centimeter, which is also one. It's one mil. That square is at 10 meters from your, your muzzle. That square is one mil. That is a one mil square. So your aiming reference, or about three and a half minutes, yes. You're, you're right. We're cool. Okay, but you see, this wasn't just an arbitrary thrown together, eh, let's just shoot at this because it's nifty. That's at 10 meters, that square is one mil. Now, what, what did we say a normal, if we're shooting two mil cones of fire, how much would you move your T&E for even coverage? Four, four mils, right? So if these targets are four mils wide and I aim at the center base of this first one, how many mils do I traverse right to shoot the next one? Four mils, because that's a good basic doctrine to teach gunnery skills is I fire a burst, my cone of fire should hopefully be two mils-ish. It definitely needs to be less than four because that target's only four mils wide, okay? And if I aim at the center of this one and I move exactly four mils right, I should be at the center of the next one, and on and on and on. So don't think of that as, oh, I'm engaging four goofy-looking individual targets because the whole point of the gunnery exercise is I fire a burst, I traverse the gun, I fire another burst, and I continue. So think of this as, for example, this could be I'm engaging an array of targets. We could say a uh, classifier target um, with respect to the target could be frontal or maybe slightly oblique. And it's not, it's not five individual targets, it could be that entire line that I'm trying to suppress. I might not even have something immediately visible, but I need to suppress that whole area. Well, if there's something hidden there, which I may not even be able to see, my A-gunner may not be able to see, correctable corrections, so I can center a, a, a beaten zone inside each of those areas. Well, it's not actually three dimensions, so we'll just use the cone of fire to represent if I would have had good effect. That makes sense? So that, that's basically helping you learn traverse and search on an arbitrary, well not arbitrary, it, it's size to represent what good gunnery should, you should be capable of doing. Does that make sense? Um, I'll talk about the, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into this. Okay, so let's start off with the zeroing exercise first, because I talked about the target itself. Um, how can, why can we zero this at 10 meters? How does that work? If I'm wanting a machine gun, I can shoot hundreds of meters away, 10 meters, really? Is that, can I, is that effective? Why? You're right, but why? The, the size of the target is scaled because I, I'm... There you go. Why, when we're establishing a 300 meter zero, you guys are right on, when we're establishing a 300 meter zero, what target are we using with a rifle? 
It's a 25 meters away, and the zero target has an aiming reference that looks like a... It represents its scales because if I know that it's about 18 inches wide-ish for full size at an actual 300 meters away, am I still about six minutes wide when it's 25 meters away? I shrink the target down. If I can shoot inside a four centimeter circle at 25 meters, that would be like shooting inside an 18 inch circle at 300 meters. So I'm still able to hit a target of that size. So we have the same scaled size and look. It's also the reason why the width of your front sight is what it is. Because how wide does your front sight appear to be in contrast to that scaled silhouette target? Pretty close to the same width, right? Now it's not arbitrary decision either. Because if I'm shooting at a target that appears the same width or slightly wider than my front sight, am I in range? If the target appears the same width as my front sight or the target is slightly wider than my front sight, am I inside 300 meters? Absolutely. So I don't have to compensate for distance. I can shoot straight in. If the target appears smaller than my front sight, do I need to compensate for distance? Quite possibly, yes. The tar your your, your uh, front sight is approximately seven minutes wide-ish, okay? And that was done that way for on purpose. So, all right, so we can use a scaled target. Now, what is that representing, that close distance? What is it in our trajectory? The line when they cross. The first intersection or the initial intersection, right? I can figure it out mathematically. If I make my bullet intersect my line of sight some point up close, it's going to correspond to a zero some further distance away. If I can do it at 25 meters, I can do it at 10 as well. What do we normally set our sights to when we do this 10 meter exercise? Depends on the weapon, okay, 240. Well, the 249 is, there you go, 240 you slip the rear sight to 500 meters, the 249 you slip to 700. What do you think that corresponds, the initial intersection of 10 meters must correspond to what zero with a 240? Exactly, if I intersect at 10 meters, that would be yielding a 500 meter zero. So if I move that rear sight to that distance and I get a point A and point A impact zero at 10 meters, that will correspond to a 500 meter zero down range. Make sense? Okay, cool. Why do you think we're using this 10 MZ line inside the M145 optic? That's indicating a 10 meter zero obviously, but it's not lined up with five, why not? Well, wait a second. I can mount this on a 240. The height of the, uh, the there you go. Perfect. The line of height from your line of bore from the line of sight is different. If I change how high the sight line is above the line of bore, that's going to change where my initial intersection needs to be to give the same zero at distance. Very good. Okay. An example of that would be, who's familiar with the small arms integration book? Okay. We've all seen this massive 400 plus page tome of index and charts and and what is it all telling us nothing <laughs> but if we know how to use it what is it trying to tell us exactly because all the nifty sights and optics and lasers that we have to issue are all going to be differing amounts of height or distance away from the bore and if we don't have a full distance range to zero at, and we're forced to do it at 25 meters, for example, we want to be reasonably confident I can actually hit something at distance if I need to, if I don't get a chance to confirm at distance, right? So you'll see things in there like, and I took this out as an example, if I mount a PAC-4 laser to an M249, and I use the right rail to mount it, I will need to use this much hold off. I'll have to go 10.7 squares or centimeters up and 7.7 .7 left of my point of aim. So what am I aiming at? Just to make sure we're clear on this. I'm still aiming at the target. I always aim at the center of my target, right? But what is this telling me? What does this mean? My bullets should be hitting here. Why? 
Okay, but if I mount that exact same laser on the top rail, on the top of the cover, it's saying I need to be 1.8 right, and I should be hitting here. Now, it's the same laser on the same machine gun. Do we understand why that is? If I have the laser on this side, Right, or, or the left or right side, or however you're choosing to mount it. And that's also true. That's exactly, that's also true as well. You'll, that's why you'll see a difference between like the PEC-2 or some of the other aiming lasers, because it's not even center of the rail. The emitter might be a different distance away from the actual center point of the rail itself which is going to change how high or low it is above the line of bore and how far left and right it is in relationship to the bore, okay? And if I have them just intersect point A and point of impact at 25 meters, where is it going to be downrange? <laughs> it's literally shooting, you're literally shooting cross side at that point. So what you're trying to do is set this up with a case of mounting it on the right rail. My laser's here my point of impact's here so that at some, well, 400 meters in this case, but at some known point down range, they're going to eventually intersect. And that would be your zero point, okay? And I use this because it was an extreme difference for the same optic on the same weapon system just to show how much of a difference that makes. Now you know why that book is so damn big, because they took all the conceivable examples of weapon systems, uh, optics, uh, mounting configurations and everything there changes what that's going to be at short distance so that someone bothered to figure that all out they write it up in a huge list of charts and here's your reference okay okay so let's get okay so the zero phase our first uh, issue with using that 10 meter target is to establish a working zero I like to think of that Zero exercise, ideally you should always confirm at distance, even with a rifle, ideally. But if nothing else, make sure you got good point aim, point of impact reference just to shoot the exercise, because that's the whole idea. You're not trying to hold off or whatever. We want your shots to lay in right where the sights indicate. Um, the first, of course, and then how does that series exercise? We start on, say, alpha, target alpha one. What is our first sequence of events there? You start single, shooting single rounds, right? Because you're just trying to shoot one shot at a time just to try and get somewhere close. Ultimately, you need to zero at how, though? Well, if you're around 30, yeah. Or the, whatever the number of round bursts are, right? Does a single round, three round group always indicate the same point of impact when we start shooting bursts? Is it possible that even if the gunner knows what they're doing, that you can have a point of impact shift when they shoot bursts? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. In theory, you wouldn't think it would matter. And it's kind of like, like hunters. This is one of my pet peeves. You always see, oh, I'm going to zero, so they sit down at a bench. Does that point of impact shooting it off of a bench yield the same point of impact shooting from some held position, like how you'd really shoot in the field. Is it possible you have a point of impact shift? Absolutely. And you don't know how much unless you actually bother to test it. I'll give you an example. M16A4. We mount an optic on it, like an ACOG. And people are so used to zeroing off of a sandbag, or worse yet, zeroing with just the forend on the sandbag and then doing the gun rider chip thing where they're trying to brace the back end of the stock, like so. Okay, you can shoot good groups like that, absolutely. You can zero that way, too. But what will your zero be if you shoot from some field position? Theoretically? Yeah. I mean, you, you can have a, a point. Uh, uh, we've tested it. Um, part of the reason or part of the problem with the AR-15 platform is the handguard and the sling swivel is tied directly to the barrel. So any pressure you're putting on the barrel influences point of impact. As an extreme example, using an optical sight, because now I have my line of sight attached directly to the upper receiver, how I'm moving the barrel is not compensated for where that point of aim in the optic is referring me to. 
we've seen point of impact shifts, and I say we, the Army shooting team, the reserve shooting team, as much as 10 minutes of angle going from a zero off of a magazine supported position versus putting a real tight loop sling and then shooting it and actually see like about uh, down about seven o'clock or so, 10 minute angle point of impact change. That's ten, and how much is that at 100 yards? 10 inches at 100. So now you're talking 30 inches at 300 because I had a good tight, good zero off of whatever, you know, off of a sandbag support, let's say, or a magazine support, and then I put this loop sling on, I'm actually pulling and getting that much of a point impact shift. Um, generally speaking, when we shoot the, um, the A4s and AFSAM or some of these other military theme matches, most everyone will not touch the handguard at all. They'll actually use their hand in front of the magazine well. Not so much that it's because it's a better position. I don't think it is. I think it's better to have your hand out on the handguard because you feel like you're on a ball bearing otherwise. But you're trying to minimize any point of impact shifts. So at least you're getting a better reference to my point of aim referring to where my actual point of impact is going to be. Okay? You can also get, experience that shooting from different positions. Um, as an example, high power rifle shooters and small bore shooters for that matter will not uncommonly have different zeros when they shoot the same rifle with the same ammunition at the same target at the same distance just because in the different position they're going to have a slight point of impact change. Uh, international rifle or a three position rifle for example for small bore you shoot standing, kneeling and prone. A high power they shoot two different stages at 200 yards, one from the standing position, one from the sitting position. The sitting position in high power is also shot rapid fire. And it's quite common to have shooters have a slight zero change to compensate for differences in how the rifle is being held. And this is a match grade rifle tuned for the competitive event and they typically have free float tubes to minimize that and you'll still experience a slight ch change. That's quite common. So, do you think if I shoot my machine gun in full auto, it might give me a slight point of impact change versus when I'm shooting single shots? Yeah. Quite possible, yeah, absolutely. So that's very uh, realistic. Um, the other thing you're establishing when you're doing this exercise is developing a good cone of fire. Ideally, you're trying to get within two mils, but the target is how wide? Four mils. So if you're inside that target, that means you must have a better than four mil cone of fire and you should get 100% score on the course, right? right? Okay. And then you're learning, okay, develop an accurate initial burst. So I know if I aim at the base of that target, where should my cone of fire be? It should pile up right in the center of that paste or tombstone looking thing, right? And then of course, so I can cleanly traverse and search and I went over why the target is the width that it is. Um, if you do this I hate to say by the book. One of the, because I mentioned I've, I've sent in a couple of 2028s hoping that our friends at the two of the 29th will revise the FM. One of the things that I've seen on qual courses when people shoot through this is you're given for the machine gun course seven rounds per paster is what it works out, right? So if I have the, the, the target five through six, you have 35 rounds in a belt to shoot those targets, right? Because it's supposed to be seven rounds per. If you interpret what the FM is trying to get the gunners to do, you should, and, and let's look at this target again. Why do you think there's only an aiming reference on the first and last target? That, exactly, that, that's your adjustment point or where what the FM calls learning to fire an accurate initial burst. When you shoot these individual targets here, you start off by doing it for zeroing purposes. One, single shots, just to conserve ammunition, and then you finish it up shooting bursts to finalize your zero when you're shooting it in full auto. That's engaging a single fixed point target, right? And you're trying to establish the idea that if I hold here, my burst ends up where I want it. I can predict that's where my shots are going to go. Well, when I'm shooting this exercise, the idea is this isn't representing any kind of specific target. It's just a target area. And I need to step, put beaten zones across this in even incremental amounts. So I need to first be able to shoot an accurate initial burst. Well, I'm going to have some reference point, whether it was designated by fire command or whatever. In theory, I could be shooting this with another gun 
gun two is going to start here, gun one is going to start here, and then we start engaging. Ideally, shooting at his pairs, shoot a burst, and then he shoots, and then we go back and forth, working away across that target area. I'm not really necessarily having to aim at the rest of these, because if my controls are good, how far away is this center target again? Four mils, and the same amount all the way across, right? So in theory, I could almost shoot that blind. Make sense? Because if I have a, a good accurate initial burst here, and I know this is four mils away, am I necessarily needing to aim at each one of those targets? Now you can, okay, obviously, but that's kind of what the idea of what the course is trying to get you to do. And you'll notice when, it, when they say the standard in here, where am I at? Um, you're supposed to shoot this within the time limit and it will say five to seven rounds per burst. What you're supposed to do then is shoot exactly one burst per target area and then move. The problem is they don't write it in the, the scoring to enforce it. If I were to write it, I would say when the shooter, okay, if there's seven engage or there's five engagements, let's say, when you finish fire, firing burst five, you're done. If you have ammunition left, you didn't do it right. And that's the whole idea. The trigger control for the exercise is a seven round burst. So you should fire exactly five seven round bursts and the exercise is done. And if you got a pile of ammo left, it's because you short stroked the trigger and you weren't supposed to. Okay, now there's nothing written to say that, well, that's a five point penalty. But one of the reasons that I, I, try, that I used to try and make that point is I kept mentioning that that target represents something four mils wide, that is the same comparative size of an E-type silhouette at 140 yards. So again, if you're just kind of like, well, I'm going to shoot a couple, two, three shots, and then I'm just, oh, I got ammunition left, so I'm going to go back, and all oh, that one needs, and you're just kind of going back and forth over the targets, big deal. You're essentially shooting a target the size of an E-type at only 140. Do I need a machine gun to do that? Absolutely not. The whole point of the exercise is shoot a controlled burst, make a positive correction, shoot another controlled burst, and do that for the exact number of target areas I'm engaging and the exercise is done. You need to do it in a time limit, which is established there, um, 30 seconds or 45 seconds depending, depending on the exercise. Um, but anyway, one of, the one of the targets that I used when we did the, the gunnery course at Camp Bullis was I just used a batch of these because I found shooting a cone of fire exercise. Um, I purposely sized this so it's a one mil square, just like we're using with the other um, the 10 meter target. And then this is a two mil center surrounded by a four mil outer circle. Okay, so you're essentially establishing the idea of trying to shoot a two mil burst but anything inside here is, is acceptable, okay? It'd be like if we had our four centimeter circle on our zero target and had another scoring ring inside of it, and that's where you want your shots to go for zero, but anything inside the big circle is okay too, all right? And that's just to your cone of fire target, just to shoot bursts, and that's it. I said then another series of targets like this, getting the idea of traversing and searching, just to make it a clean five target exercise, and then I set up this. Now you see all the targets on there? I actually took that from four different targets, but what you, the, I set the exercise up, and you can't even see it, but there's actually a l very, very light gray. I, I set it for like 10% gray with a dotted line, and it's a four mil circle. All right, well, and there's five of them. See, if I start here, I'm going to search up. And there's five targets you have to hit. How are you going to hit them all? Well, if I have my zero proper, I set my sights, I'm going to start at that aiming reference, and I'm going to fire a burst. If I shoot an accurate initial burst and do a correct amount of adjustment, which would be four mils in this case, because that's the normal adjustment, right? I make a four mil adjustment, where should my next burst be? four mils up, which happens to be the center of the target above it that you can't see. So the idea is you can't just, oh, I'm going to aim here and shoot another burst. You can only aim in once 
and you can't cheat it. <laughs> There's nothing there to aim at anymore. You have to trust that you're making a good adjustment, shoot your next burst, and then make another good adjustment and repeat the process for five areas. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, the transition course is essentially trying to get you to learn to shoot um, an accurate initial burst on an individual fixed point target at various distances. The courses of fire are good exercises, I think. If you go through and you can shoot a good score, clean score, on both the 10 meter exercise, especially the 10 meter exercise, and also then on the transition course, you're getting the basics down of, okay, aim center base, fire good, good solid cone of fire, and get my hits where they need to be. That's all well and good. The problem is, and I'll, I don't have a solution for, all the stuff I talked about before lunch, how would you set a target up to train that? How would you evaluate someone's ability to shoot good grazing fire? I mean, how, how would you establish a 3D target? I mean, I guess maybe like the balloons they used in the video. But I mean, as far as in terms of a training environment where I have a pile of people, I got to run through this range and I got to get done before the end of the afternoon or whatever for the day qual, how would you establish a, a scorable, trainable exercise to test that skill set. See, I mean, how do you establish that? Oh yeah, that he's capable of shooting good enfilading fire when the course of fire, the range itself, is forcing you to do the exact opposite. And that's why I use the, the picture of that Rett's range where the ideal position to shoot from would be illegal <laughs> because you would be shooting outside of the left limit in that picture's case, make sense? But that's really the ideal way you want to use this thing. So how would you train that? So they took the easy answer is, well, I'll get 10 firing points and you shoot at a bunch of RETS targets because we already have that kind of targetry equipment in our system and we'll make a qual around that. Well, if you understand the fundamentals of the gunnery skills, you can use that to learn the shooting portions, tie it into the gunnery theory then, and still be very effective. But if you never really learn theory, because the 11 day course they dropped and we no longer host it, and there's no MOS for this anymore, well, here, you carry it. <laughs> but you see what my point? It's kind of like, well, we're just going to issue artillery pieces to people and, ah, eh, you know, shoot them off if someone says fire. You know? Okay, uh, using the sights. Uh, I've heard this stated that, all oh, there's no point in adjusting for sights. Can you hold over to make corrections for targets at distance? Is that possible? Absolutely, you can. How much holdover are you going to need for different di ranges, though? It's one of the, the, one of the main reasons why I like to enforce people when they shoot on the transition course, get in the habit of slipping your sights. The A gunner should be telling you the target distance you're going to engage, put that on your sight, and then engage, because you can hold point of, excuse me, center base on all your targets all the way from four to 800 or whatever other distance, as long as the correction is built into your sight. You don't have to worry about, well, how much do I have to hold over for, for that target? You hold the same. The holdover is built into the sight. Okay. Just to give you an example here, this is a chart that's in the handout and you're going to get copies of all this stuff. Um, this is just kind of a generic come up chart to correct different amounts of elevation um, at different distances. So to go from 100 to 200 is a figure about two, three minutes up. To go from 900 to 1000, figure about eight minutes up. This shows you how much of that, what that correction is worth at that distance. So eight minutes up corresponds to about 80 inches of holdover to go from 900. So if you shoot with a 900 yard zero straight in at a target a thousand, only 100 yards further, you'll actually be 80 inches low versus only six inches low if you have 100 yard zero shooting at 200. Does that make sense? Okay, so as an example, let's say you leave your sight set to 500 because that's what you have your zero for, and we engage a target 800 meters away. How much drop would you have? And how much holdover would that take? So I already figured it out for us. I need to go about, and this is going to change for ammunition, and okay, but this just gives you a rough idea how much for most standard velocity cartridges. To go from five to six, be about five minutes. Six to seven, 
six minutes, seven to eight, another six minutes, which is a 17 minute holdover that you would need. That corresponds to you would be 136 inches low if you left this on the gun. Now, can you hold over that much? Yeah, sure. It's about three targets height. If I aim normally aim center base and I can envision holding three targets higher, I should still get the same impact down range. Okay? That also works out to about five mils, which you could theoretically just dial on the T and E too. Aim at the base of it, come up five clicks on your T and E, and then shoot straight in, and that would be your holdover then for, for, for 800. Okay? Or put it on the site and aim at the center base just like you would normally. Okay? Any like questions I said before, there? a lot of this, probably a little dry, but I, again, I'll kind of repeat what I'd said initially. If you learn theory, you can apply it to anything. And I, I use an analogy, just while we're waiting, I'll use an analogy from the music world. If I gave you a guitar and said, well, you don't understand, if, if you don't know how to play, don't understand the theory, but okay, press this finger here and press that finger there, you could probably play some song like that. And you'd be fine if that's all you ever wanted to play. But if you need to learn a new song, you're going to have to relearn a different sequence from scratch. If you learn the theory, though, you can pick up tunes much quicker because I can say something like that is in the key of A Lydian. And it would make sense because you would know what scale that is. You would kind of have an idea what, it, what it's based off of. You know, it's kind of like you learn the language the ideas behind it and you'll more readily pick things up. Shooting, marksmanship, all the different equipment, it's, it's quite easy. Just a quick analogy, we had when the, um, was it, the PDS-18s first came out, which is a laser sight for the 203. We actually had a guy from Rock Island visit and he was going to, okay, this is how this piece of equipment works. A friend of mine in my unit, we were going through the, the TM and we actually found a typo. How did we know it was a typo? Well, it was a published chart showing that each click per, and it was supposed to be, okay, this chart, and at this distance, one click will move you this far. And we're going through the manual, I'm like, okay, a couple of these have to be wrong because they don't match up. If you move this much at this distance, it has to move a corresponding, twice the corresponding amount when you're twice as far away, and the numbers weren't jiving. So they were able to find that and issue, and we had never seen the thing before because we knew how it should work. Or not, let me rephrase that. We knew the theory behind how something like that is supposed to work. Therefore, the published data had to be incorrect because it wouldn't match up mathematically. Make sense?